Again, hello, my name is Courtney. I am with North Dakota Assistive. I am joined today by Jamis from the Minnesota Star Program. And we are here to talk about accessible gardening. Um, during the webinar, if you'd like to use recordings, you can do so by navigating to your little um, menu bar and clicking on show captions, and then you can see the transcript. Uh, this recording is or this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view it later. Um, and it will be posted on our YouTube channel, so we'll make sure we send out a copy of the recording to you. I'm going to be posting uh, the slides in the chat. I'll do that a couple times um, throughout the session. There will be two sets of slides, actually. Um, we have uh, kind of split these, this presentation into two parts. So the first part is going to be led by Jameis. And it's going to be all about creating an accessible um, and sensory garden experience. And then the second part of the webinar um, will be by me, and that's more on some different adaptive tools uh, to help you uh, create and maintain your garden. So I am going to uh, let Jameis take over, and I will be putting his slides in the chat. Uh, so please take a look for that. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A um, and we will do our best to answer them. Cardi, just want to make sure my slides are showing. My slide is showing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Jameis Werenberg and uh, on the screen is a picture of me. Um, I'm a white male with dark brown hair and blue ring glasses. Um, I'm an assistive technology specialist with the Minnesota Star Program. And I am incredibly excited to present to you today about sensory gardens and accessible gardening. So a little bit about myself first. Um, I originally went to school at the University of Minnesota and I obtained a, a bachelor's degree in environmental design and a master's degree in landscape architecture. Um, so I had big dreams, big, big dreams to become a landscape architect, but uh, my dreams didn't pan out. So. I had to do something differently and I decided to go back to school and get my associate's degree in IT management. Uh, and I've, uh, I've been focusing on assistive technology for the last five years. So um, throughout high school and while attending college, I worked at uh, different um, organizations that help people with disabilities uh, become more independent in their lives. Um, and I've always said that the background of working in social services and my degree in IT management make my job the best job in the world. Uh, and I love it every day. So Courtney and I uh, use assistive technology to help individuals throughout the state, our states, uh, access the technology they need to live, learn, work, and play. Um, as you can see, I come from a pretty diverse and colorful background, both educationally and professionally. Um, but landscaping and design is always going to be my favorite side passion. Um, so I, I was thrilled to be able to present about this today. So I just want to uh, make a quick note that as I go through my presentation today, uh, I, I will not be making any specific recommendations for specific plants to put in the garden. And that's because there are literally thousands of options that are going to work great in my planting zone, but might not work great in yours. Instead, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some of the qualities in a plant that would work well for a sensory garden. Then I would suggest that you connect with your local nursery or garden center to find plants that's going to match those qualities and that's going to be hardy for your, for your particular planting zone. And besides, I feel like picking out plants is one of the most uh, best parts of, of gardening, in my opinion. So let's talk about sensory gardens. Um, have you ever heard of the term sensory garden? Maybe you have, or maybe you've heard of the term and you don't know really what it is and, and what it entails. Well, today I wanted to highlight what a sensory garden is, uh, what are the qualities that make up a sensory garden, and how to make any garden accessible so anyone can enjoy the benefits of gardening. Then Courtney, like she said, will talk about specific, specific adaptive equipment and tools that you can use in the garden to make gardening tasks easier. And our hope today is that you will leave with the inspiration to garden, for one, um, to enjoy the benefits of green spaces and gardening for your mental and physical health, and give you some ideas on different accessible tools that you can utilize in the garden. 
So a sensory garden. A sensory garden is a garden that stimulates all five senses of the human body, and that includes sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste. By triggering the senses, uh, a space can encourage you to be more aware of your surroundings and be more meaningful and present in that environment. A proper sensor, sensory garden uh, will also encourage you to escape the stress of everyday life and allow you to immerse yourself in the space. So think of it as like a retreat from the hustle and bustle of our busy chaotic world that we all live in. And it's been pretty chaotic over the last couple of years. Um, sensory gardens fall under the category of therapeutic gardens and they include um, healing gardens as well. You may have heard the term healing gardens. Healing gardens uh, are a little bit different. They enhance your sense of well-being and they reduce stress and calm your mind like a sensory garden would. But you often see them attached to healthcare uh, facilities such as hospitals or rehabilitation facilities. Um, and that's to give the patients and families a place to contemplate, to reduce the stress and anxiety that they're dealing with um, and to heal from their injury or accident. Sensory gardens differ in the fact that they aren't necessarily linked to healthcare facilities, although they can be. Um, sensory gardens can be integrated into any setting, really. So they can include your local neighborhood parks. I've seen them at state and national parks. I've seen them at day daycares, schools, long-term care facilities. Um, and it could even be in your backyard, which is kind of what we're talking about today. So by incorporating all five senses, it can help everyone enjoy the garden. For example, uh, a, a visitor who's blind might not be able to see the flowers, but they can hear the sounds and touch the greenery that the garden can produce. On the flip side, a person who is deaf can't hear the sounds of the garden, but could delight in the sights and the smells of the garden that it can produce. Um, and I would say that both of these experiences can be equally pleasurable. Um, so um, in this slide, um, I have a short audio clip that I recorded using free sound. So this is something I created. It represents the sped up garden experience of what it might be like to feel uh, the garden for someone who is blind. So I would encourage you to close your eyes, listen to the sound of the garden. Um, there's no one talking on this audio clip. There's only sounds of birds singing, feet walking on the gravel, um, some water that's battling in the background, some fro frogs that are croaking, um, and a little um, faint humming of a song called Mockingbird. Also, please adjust the volume uh, according to your comfort level. I've been told it plays a little loud, so. So here we go. Close your eyes. Just enjoy this for a second.
So having experienced this with your eyes closed, did your mind help you imagine yourself in that space? And was it a pleasurable experience, even though you could not see the garden for itself? Now, understandably, this experience would not be as pleasurable for someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, since the sole sense that you're relying on here is your hearing. Um, someone who is deaf or hard of hearing would likely find more pleasure in the garden by seeing the wildlife, uh, which is why I included some pictures here on the slide, um, smelling the flowers and touching the soft leaves of a plant. Now that we've gotten a taste of how important the senses play in experiencing the garden, let's look at each individual sense and how the design and plants play a role in heightening each sense. So the first one we're going to investigate is the sense of sight. Designing with sight involves using colors, shape, sizes, and textures that draw your eyes' uh, attention. Color can be bright and bold with high contrast, or it could be monochromatic, which, are, uh, which is more of a subtle grade of, of the same color. Uh, it's really up to you and your choice. Um, color plays one of the most important roles in creating visual interest in the garden. Um, if you happen to have a site with a great view like this one on this picture on this slide, um, capture that view and frame it with the plant with the help of plants. Uh, it can happen if you ha um, if you happen to have the opposite, if it's a not a good view, um, you can cover that view with the help of plants as well. So in the picture on this slide, the tall columnar trees are helping to frame the rolling countryside in the distance. And it makes it feel like kind of a, a rolling English countryside. Um, plants are the medium in the garden and capture the essence of this space. So inside the garden, you can showcase areas of interest inside of the garden uh, to create interest through the use of landscape features. Um, those include water features, sculptures, shiny objects that can draw your attention away from the stressful thinking and into a more inquisitive mindset. So using plants that have variated heights and textures can create um, flow and interest, uh, visual interest. Um, and that's because our, our eyes love the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of soft and coarse, light and dark, short and tall, those those opposites really make it um, uh, attract uh, attract us to those to those elements. Um, they encourage our eyes to move across the site and take in the entire composition of the garden. Putting in plants that attract wildlife can help bring the wildlife closer to you. This can provide visual interest as you look at the beauty of the animal and watch their behavior. Uh, examples of this are represented in a few pictures I have on this slide. Um, which includes a hummingbird getting nectar from a pink flower bud uh, and a large bumblebee crawling over a round blue flower. Um, putting plants that add visual movement, such as ornamental grasses, can actually capture the movement of wind. So in the animation on this picture, it's showing how the wind can move across the grass and create the grass to sway. So wind is something that isn't visible to the eye, but it can be made visible through rhythmic swaying of ornamental grasses. Sculptures that can draw your attention, like the water feature, like water features and, and shiny objects, can also create interest. A couple examples that I have on this slide include a water feature that spins water into a vortex shape. Uh, this invites the visitor to stick their hand into the water and interact with it. In fact, that's what it's designed to do. Um, and then we have a shiny mirrored tile planter that spins and it casts light from the sun all around the space uh, like a disco ball. So the glints of the sun that are reflected in, from those mirrors into your eye make you look towards that area and pay, pay attention to, to what's going on over there. Designing for smell is equally important. So certain aromas can create emotional connections. For instance, most of us may have a nostalgic reaction to freshly cut grass, freshly baked apple pie, freshly cut Christmas trees, or maybe a fresh bouquet of red roses, because a lot, oftentimes those scents will trigger pleasurable memories of the past. And that's the reason why a lot of these scents are, are used in perfumes, lotions, and candles, for instance. Um, they trigger a happy response, uh, and the same response can be triggered in the garden when you use those scents in the garden as well. Um, when designing for smell, we want we need to be intentional with our plant selection 
and think about putting in plants that provide scent throughout the entire season so that when visitors come back to visit, they have a unique experience every time they come into the garden. So the picture on this slide is a young child who is smelling uh, a purple lilac bloom. Uh, and I don't know about you, but this happens to be one of my most favorite springtime scents. Here we have some ideas for, for plants that offer heavy scents in the garden. A few examples include roses, lavender, lemongrass, gardenia, jasmine, freesia, hyacinth, lilac, and apple blossoms. Uh, the pictures on this slide are of a pink rose, a blue hyacinth, and a cluster of pink, of pink apple blossoms. Um, I can only imagine what that uh, combination would smell like if we had the ability to digitally smell uh, scratch and sniff our screen right now. And I'm hoping that th that technology will be available someday soon. Um, so fragrant herbs are also uh, provide, they also provide a, a strong emotional response and make a space more inviting. Uh, frequently used herbs include rosemary, mint, oregano, chive, sage, and many more. Um, the benefits of planting these for smell is that you can also use the herbs in your cooking, which we're going to talk about in our taste section in a, in a little bit. Flowers and herbs are typically um, kind of the go-to choices uh, for smell in the garden, but many forget that mulch is very aromatic as well. Uh, most mulches are made from cedar and pine trees, which, uh, already, which we've already established is a great smell to many people. But uh, many might, may not know that there's different mulches out there that have a unique smell, such as cocoa bean mulch. Um, cocoa bean mul mulch is a by byproduct of uh, making chocolate, and the mulch literally smells like chocolate when you walk by it. So imagine walking through the garden and you're smelling chocolate and roses um, and what that experience might be like. Um, maybe, maybe very romantic, perhaps, or maybe it'll just make you crave your favorite candy bar. But either way, uh, it can trigger a response. I just want to note that cocoa bean mulch is toxic to pets. So if you do have pets, um, use caution when using this mulch. Hey, Miss, this is yes. Courtney. I just wanted to share a quick comment that was in the chat. It was from Sue. And she said that she really enjoys lilacs. Uh, two great memories from her grandparents' farm. Yep, there's that nostalgic piece that I was talking about. Um, we often have a lot of scents that are very nostalgic to us. And so incorporating those into a sensory garden is very important. Thanks for sharing that, Sue. Um, several de design elements uh, are listed on this slide for sound, um, but we were just hearing those on the video. So let's review some of those elements that the video shared plus some extras. So water trickling, the video had some crunchy gravel below somebody's feet, um, wind chimes. I didn't put that in the, the, the sound video, cl video clip, but that is also often commonly used in gardens. Um, and then wildlife. So songbirds, frogs, crickets, squirrels, whatever um, can give some um, outdoor concerts um, as we heard in the, in the video clip as well. Um, having this design element add, adds dimension to the site and innately captures a visitor's interest. There are several planting solutions that will help create uh, interesting sounds in the garden. Plants that attract wildlife can include plants that produce berries, that, um, and in turn that will attract songbirds. Water um, can attract frogs, uh, flowers can attract bumblebees, hummingbirds. Um, they all make noise. There is a picture on this slide of a cedar waxwing uh, eating the berries off of a crabapple tree. I have literally myself seen hundreds of birds, not necessarily cedar waxwings, but birds eating the remnants of uh, winter berries from a crabapple tree that's in my backyard. Um, and it's truly a sight and a sound to hear. Um, Many plants create sound on their own, including many species of ornamental grasses. Um, so when grasses, grasses swoosh in the wind, the seed heads are hitting each other and they can create a soothing sound. Certain trees are named after um, some of their auditory traits like the quaking aspen. Uh, their leaves are designed to catch the wind and sound like they are quaking. 
Um, false indigo is another plant that's uh, also called rattleweed or rattle bush. Uh, what this does is it, it has a seed pod that dries out that um, the seeds rattle inside that pod and it makes it sound like little rattles in the wind. Um, when thinking about plants that you may want to include in the garden, be sure to think about texture and how textures can be used to create um, interest and encourage visitors to interact with the landscape. Texture can come in uh, different forms. So you have your soft, smooth, rough, and spiky are just a, a few of the descriptors of, of texture. Um, and temperatures as well, uh, whether hot or cold, also are important feature that you can feel when you're in the garden. Being too hot can really ruin the experience. I know I've, I've been to a couple uh, places where it's extremely hot uh, and it, it, made, it made for a more miserable experience. Um, so be, be careful with black surfaces or dark surfaces that absorb sun, uh, that make the surface and the surrounding air more intense. Uh, avoid dark colored materials in direct sun and consider selecting plants that will offer shade from the sun and the high winds. Um, design, maybe design covered seating areas for respite from the sun if you can. Um, when it comes to plants and texture, there are some common plants that people tend to gravitate towards, um, such as the soft velvety leaves of lamb's ear. Uh, that's the first picture on this slide. Um, the light um, plumes of ornamental grasses and the spongy damp carpet of moss. Um, there are th three pictures on this slide. The first one again is the lamb's ear. Um, the plant is about the same size and the shape as an actual lamb's ear and it has a soft velvety feel to it. Um, the next picture is spongy carpet, uh, is a spongy carpet, um, sorry, spongy green carpet of, of moss. Uh, this looks like a, like a soft shade carpet to me, uh, and it's just begging me for, for me to touch it. Uh, the last picture on the slide is someone running their hands over the seed heads of a field of ornamental grasses. Um, and they're running their fingers through the, like the soft feathery tops of a ornamental grass. So um, designing for taste, um, definitely there are vegetable gardens that are strictly engineered for eating and tasting. Um, but you may not know that you can incorporate edible plants into a regular flower garden as well. Plants that um, produce edible berries, such as raspberries, strawberries, and blueberries can make the perfect little surprise treats in the garden. Plus the songbirds love them just as much, sometimes too much and you don't get any of the berries. So you have to be careful about that. Um, I would also caution you against using black um, uh, berry bushes as they tend to spread pretty aggressively like raspberries uh, and they'll quickly get out of hand if you're not mindful. Um, as I talked about before, there's different herbs that can be planted for smell, but they can also be used in different dishes that you cook. So basil, again, basil, parsley, rosemary, mint, and so on, all can be tucked into the garden to add visual interest they can capture smell and they can provide a tasty garnish to any dish that you create. Uh, and how convenient would it be for you to just cut a little bunch of parsley off in the garden and garnish uh, your dish? Um, many people may not know that certain flowers are edible as well. Um, and they're often used in, uh, to garnish dishes and, and baked goods uh, in very fancy restaurants. So flower tops such as nasturtiums or pansies and arugula can be used in edible garnish to decorate any food item. So all these ideas, we've made it through the senses, all these ideas and talking about all the benefits of a sensory garden may make you eager to start creating a garden of your own. So one of the first steps to designing your sensory garden is to consider the layout. Um, the garden can be laid out in a couple different ways. Um, the first layout shows kind of distinct zones. So the first image on the slide shows a garden plan with a sink, six distinct zones um, that could represent different sensory zones. For example, uh, you may enter in the garden through zone A, and this would be a zone where you focus on sound. Then you would transition into zone B, 
uh, which may be a zone that focuses on site. And then you transition into CDE, et cetera. So in this example, you're forcing the visitor to experience the site according to your design choices. And this is uh, more of a progressional type of experience. So another layout uh, is to take the entire site, incorporate all the senses and design principles into one all-inclusive, all-in-one multi-sensory experience. So this means that the sensory design principles and plantings are incorporated together throughout the entire site. So um, sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste are present wherever you go. Um, in this example, uh, you're giving the visitor a more subtle experience and you're gently review, revealing those um, sensory elements to them. So gardening is a great way to enjoy comfortable physical and mental activity. Um, there are several studies out there that highlight the positive aspects of gardening and the role that gardening can play in your overall well-being which includes um, you know, increased range of motion, increased leg and core strength, et cetera. Um, in addition, gardening can increase your mood, reduce anxiety, um, making it a positive activity for both mental health and your well-being. Um, there's even a branch of physical therapy called horticulture therapy. If you've not heard of that, it uses plants and plant-related activities to improve your mobility, your muscle coordination, your strength, your balance, your endurance, your socialization, and even your memory skills. Um, so everyone is different uh, with their physical levels when it comes to gardening. So I wanted to look at some different methods for gardening that can um, make gardening more accessible for everyone. Um, we're gonna look at three different types of accessible gardening techniques that will highlight accessibility. Then Courtney will take over and talk about her accessible tools um, that will make physical tasks of gardening like watering, weeding, and planting more manageable. And our hope is that it will encourage everyone to garden. One of the simplest and easy ways to get started with gardening is to use containers. So with containers, you can get the soil and the garden plants at a level, at a height level that is accessible for you. Pots come in different heights and can be set on plant stands to increase the height even more if it's not tall enough for you. Uh, I have pictured um, three different types of options when you're considering plant stands. The first picture um, has four baskets that are hanging from a black metal plant stand. Uh, the middle picture shows um, plants and containers at different heights to show how you can spruce up any hard surface area. So you don't have to have necessarily bare soil to start a garden. You can start a garden just in your patio and it may be all hardscaped, um, but, but container gardening can, can soften that landscape and make it more inviting. And then the final picture is just three simple plant stands at different heights with potted plants on top. Uh, there's lots of options out there, guys. So um, this is just a, a, just a quick sampling of, of what's out there. Container gardening makes it easier for the gardener to reach the plant, to weed, to water, and to plant. Um, large size pots also are heavier, um, which can make them stable enough to lean on for support and prevent falling. One step up from container gardening is raised bed gardening. So here you have a larger area of garden to plant and work with. It allows a chair or wheelchair to get underneath the bed for easier access. And a raised bed is great for areas with very limited space. So a raised bed garden will have less compacted soil, it'll have less weed pressure, and it will have better water drainage. Uh, in the springtime, these beds, if they're outside, will warm up quicker for uh, earlier planting and faster growing cycles. Uh, which means that you'll have more mature plants and vegetables earlier in the growing season than, than regular um, ground gardens. Uh, if you have, um, we do have a few examples of some raised bed gardens displayed on this slide. The first picture is showing a, a rolling indoor outdoor raised bed garden by Accessible Gardens. Um, this garden is on uh, some caster wheels, so it makes it really easy to wheel it inside and outside. 
Um, the garden will collect and divert any of the excess water in this uh, raised bed garden to a container that is anchored to the leg um, that you can recycle the used water if you want, uh, which I thought was a, was a cool feature. Um, the middle picture is a plastic raised bed garden that allows a person to get their feet under, under the garden bed, which is perfect for someone um, who needs to sit on a chair or is in a wheelchair. And then the third picture is a, another raised bed garden, um, which is more permanent, which allows someone in a chair or wheelchair to access the bed from both sides at multiple locations. So this type of raised bed garden is probably a good choice for maybe a community garden where there might be multiple people working together to maintain a garden. Vertical gardening is another way to give someone easier access to plant, water, and weed their garden. It also reduces the garden bed footprint um, for a more compact and eco-friendly design option. Waste water is lessened because as you water from the top, the excess drips down into the next tier, down to the next tier until it reaches the bottom. So on this slide, there are a few options to, to consider when vertical gardening. Um, this first picture shows an inexpensive canvas shoe organizer. So instead of stuffing the pockets with shoes, each pouch is stuffed with soil and a plant. Um, so it makes it for kind of a cheaper option to create a vertical garden. The second image is a picture of the farm stand, so, sorry, the farm stand, um, which can grow 12 to 36 different fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, herbs, or edible flowers all in one stand. Um, it can be placed indoors or outdoors, and it will even self-water and self-fertilize itself. So this option makes it extremely easy for anyone to garden, to eat, and to eat fresh uh, grown produce. And then the third picture is um, taking some planting trays and stacking several of them on top of one another to form a vertical tower of plants. So uh, that's all I had for you guys today. Um, I wanted to share with you um, a resource list that I have hyperlinks to the different resources that I used to put together this presentation. Um, and then we'll move on to Courtney, who will talk about the different assistive tools and adaptations to make potting, planting, and weeding easier for everyone. So Courtney, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Jameis. I feel so calm and relaxed. It's like I just was Good. meditating for an hour. That's the point. I never did. <laughs> and I just feel so good. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I'm going to share my slides and I ask Jameis that you make sure that to tell me if I'm doing it right, as we know, I have seem to have some issues with that for some reason. Uh, okay. Can you see my slides, Jameis? I can, yep, you're good to go. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, so now that we are all calm and inspired, ready to get out in the garden, I wanted to provide examples of some different adaptive tools that can help everyone garden. Um, so this next section is really gonna focus on the tools. Um, Again, my name is Courtney. I am an assistive technology professional uh, with North Dakota Assistive, which is the Assistive Technology Act for the state of North Dakota. Um, I have worked in the assistive technology field for about 10 years um, and love to garden. I find it peaceful and relaxing, something that allows me to slow down and um, be focused on just one area. So for me, it really contributes to my overall um, mental health well-being, um, as well as physical health. Um, so getting started, uh, this first slide is just the intro slide. There's a person um, in a row garden, and there are some fresh spring lettuces that are growing, and it looks like the person is going to thin those lettuces uh, so they are at the right spacing. 
So I know this seems kind of a funny way to start, but the first slide I have is talking about organizing and maintaining your tools. So you can have the greatest uh, tools in the world, but if you can't get to them and, you, um, and they're not maintained, you won't be able to use them. So I encourage you to keep uh, your tools organized and easily accessible. Um, the picture on the screen is of a work area, I think in a garage, and it's got vertical storage um, with adjustable height shelving. It's got some clear um, baskets that pull out. It's got a pegboard in the back where you can see all the different tools that are hung up neatly. Um, and then it also has hanging space for long handled tools like a rake and a shovel. Um, there's also a ladder that's hanging. So this is a great way to make sure you can see your tools, they're top of mind, you remember they're there um, and keep them accessible to use. Um, there's so many great ideas on Pinterest. Um, I have linked an article that had some good ideas that I thought um, I feel like a the pot calling the kettle black over here because my tool shed is a disaster at the moment that you can hardly walk in. So um, hopefully I'll get my tushy out there and organize my tool shed so I can use it. Um, and I also wanted to talk about the importance of keeping your tools sharp um, because it requires less effort that you need to exert and allows for greater precision. So if you are, you know, delicately trimming a rose bush, if you have a sharp pruner, that is going to do a better job. So I've, I've linked a couple different tool sharpening options. The first one is Still. It's an all-in-one tool sharpening device that's actually available from Ace Hardware. And then I found another tool sharpener um, that's more for like pruners, loopers, and shears from Gardner Supply Company. And lastly, um, there's a hyperlink on this slide about how to properly maintain your garden tools for long lasting use. Um, kind of the main highlights are, are threefold. One is to wipe down your tools um, after you use them, just keep a rag out there, um, wipe off that dirt and debris so you don't get uh, rusting and corrosion. The second part is to uh, keep those moving parts oiled um, so they move freely without uh, as much effort. And then the third is keep your tools sharp. And then the next part, next slide I have is about keeping your tools nearby. So once again, we can have wonderful tools to use, but if they're not near us when we need them, um, you know, and we might not remember that they're there, what good are they to us? So there are a ton of great options um, for ways to move your garden tools around the garden with you. Uh, one option is a rolling garden caddy. So what this is, it is a five gallon bucket that's on uh, wheels and you can tilt it, move it around the garden. Um, around the five gallon bucket is like a little apron with different pockets. You can put your different tools in and um, you can also put long handle tools in the uh, opening of the bucket. Um, so that is a rolling garden caddy. I like that it has wheels, it has everything there, um, ready to go so you don't have to get up and down and do, exert um, as much effort uh, when you're working in a space. So that's the picture on the left. It's a woman um, using a rolling bucket caddy to uh, move tools around the garden. Um, you can also get a bucket that has a or a bucket caddy that is a five gallon bucket essentially with a little apron around it that has different pockets for your tools. Um, of course, you have to consider, you know, heaviness of the bucket if you'll be able to move it easily. So that's why I, I like the wheeled option. There are also totes or little tool bags um, that you can move around with lots of different pockets to keep things organized. Um, and then there are gardening aprons that can completely cover your clothes, um, which is nice so you don't have to try and scrub dirt out of things. Um, and then you can, there are ones that have large pockets on the front that you can place your, your produce in, you know, your garden hall, if you're picking zucchini out there, instead of, you know, putting them all in a pile, 
and then picking them up, you could be putting them into your apron. Um, and then also tool belts. Um, there are tool belts uh, that are made specifically for garden tools. Um, there are ones that are worn crossbody, like the woman on the right is wearing. She's uh, working in her garden wearing a crossbody tool belt that's got uh, several different pockets with seeds and hand tools and shears. Um, and so everything's right there. Or you can do more of a traditional carpenter work belt that sits around the waist, um, keeps your tools right there, ready for you to use. The next slide I have is about uh, ways to reduce strain on your knees. Um, so this is particular for if you're doing in-ground planting, um, but also if you are say filling pots um, that are lower to the ground and maybe you want to reduce some strain on your knees while doing that. Um, so the first picture I have is just of a foam kneeler uh, pad and we see these all over the place. Um, usually you can get them for five or six dollars. I happen to find one um, that's made by the company Gorilla Grip and it's an extra dense um, thick foam pad that just would prov provide a little more support than some of those thinner ones you can get for very inexpensive. Um, a step up from that would be to consider a garden kneeler, is what they're called. Um, so if you do a search for a garden kneeler, you'll find many different options. Um, but what these are is they're um, a little bench that has handles and that bench level can be adjusted either down. So if you are kneeling to work in the garden, in an in-ground garden, um, like the woman in the picture is kneeling down on this uh, garden kneeler to work in her in-ground garden. Um, or you can adjust the level and bring it up and sit on it actually. Then there's handles on both sides to help you raise from a kneeling or a seated, seated position uh, up. So great for stability as well. Oftentimes these garden kneelers have little pockets on the side so you can store a few tools in there. Again, keeping everything nice and close to you. And then a step up from that is a garden cart with a swivel seat. Um, so that's my last picture on the right. It's a four wheeled cart made of metal. It has a swivel seat that looks like an old tractor seat. You can move all the way around. Um, so you can work in one area and then swivel around um, without moving the cart at all, just swivel your seat and work on the opposite side of you. Um, these carts are nice. Um, you can sit on them. Um, you can put your tools in the little caddy that's at the back. They usually have uh, long handled uh, or yeah, long handled handles um, that some can adjust up and down. And they're a great way to reduce um, the amount of bending and strain on your knees. You could also consider knee pads, um, you know, that you can get at any hardware store. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about some different uh, hand tools, kind of really get into adaptive tools. Uh, and first off, I wanted to talk about some ways you can adapt tools you might already have at home. Maybe you have a spade that you love. Um, well, why go out buy a new one uh, if you can adapt to your current one to meet your needs? Um, so there's many ways to do this. Um, I'm just gonna highlight a few different ones. Uh, the first option I have is called the Easy Hold Silicone Universal Cuffs. Um, so these are a cuff that have two um, holes, uh, one on each side of the cuff, and it can go around any tube type of device. So, uh, and then rests along the back of the hand. So in the picture example, is a person that is holding a hose in one hand using the cuff and a broom in the other. And they aren't having to grip it all because the cuff is keeping it connected to their hand. Uh, so it's great for someone with a weak grip or no grip strength. The next option I have is about industrial twist ties. 
Um, these can be used for many different purposes in uh, a garden, but um, one way to consider them for, for us is to think about using them to add a cuff type of example um, to your existing spade or, or shovel. Um, so they are extra long. There's different lengths. So you could get them say in a 10 inch length and they're just like a really thick twist tie that has foam uh, padding on the outside that is um, weatherproof. And it's, it's pretty comfortable to hold in the hand, but you could twist that and create a custom grip on your shovel or other tool. Um, they're also great to be used to organize hoses and cords, um, and even can be used to supplant uh, support plants um, that might need a little extra help with that. And then the third example I have on the screen is of this foam grip tubing. Um, basically, it's like a small pool noodle um, where there are different uh, diameter openings depending on what you'd like to put inside to provide a larger grip that is cushioned. And then lastly, I don't have a picture of this, but it's just grip tape um, can be added to your existing tools to give you a little better grip, um, maybe require a little bit less strength to hold on to something. Grip tape is usually uh, used on baseball bats, tennis rackets, um, that sort of thing. Um, but there are many different kinds out there for a grip tape. Jameis uh, wanted to make sure everybody knows that he loves easy hold uh, silicone universal cuffs for everything, not just gardening instruments. And I second that. And the nice thing about those is you can put them in the dishwasher. Okay, I went on to the next slide and this is about um, another grip aid called the active hands grip aid. Um, so this is uh, really great for someone who has weak or no grip um, to be able to hold on to a hand tool um, or any other small item that you would need to hold in your fist. Uh, so what this does is it goes around the wrist um, and then over the top of the back of the hand and the fingers. And then it has these little loop pulls and you pull that in and it closes your hand into a fist position around the item you'd like to hold. Um, and then it Velcros down. Um, and so you really don't need to have any grip in order to be able to hold a tool. So there's a person um, holding a hammer uh, using this active hands grip aid tool. Um, this company also makes uh, these grip aids for people that have limb differences. Um, so they have a couple different options depending on your specific needs. Next slide I have is about ergonomic garden tools. Um, first and foremost, just look for well-made tools and consider tools that have a cushioned grip. Uh, there's many options out there. A few that are really well-reviewed are the Corona hand tools that have comfort gel grips. Uh, so there's a, there's a link in the slide that you can go and access that. Uh, there's a website called arthritissupplies.com. They have a whole um, lineup of different tools for folks that have arthritis. And then uh, Fiskars, the scissor maker, actually has a, a good range of gardening tools. Um, and some of them are uh, certified ease of use by the Arthritis Foundation. So good for someone that has arthritis, um, especially their ergonomic garden tool set. So that's what I have featured. The image I have featured is a three, three different hand tools um, from that Fiskars uh, ergonomic line. They just have these nice cushion grips um, and they're well-made. There's little hooks at the end or holes at the end so you can hang it on your hook board, keep your tools organized. Okay, on the next slide, I have another line of ergonomic tools. Um, and it is called the Easy Grip Garden Tool Line. Um, that's the name of the company. Um, but they make hand tools 
for the garden that have upright um, handles. So you can keep your hand in a neutral handshake position and hold on to say your garden trowel or um, uh, your garden rake. So they make small hand tools, short hand tools that have um, that upright cushion. To add on to those, you can get what's called an uh, arm support cuff. So those kind of extend and um, they run along the forearm and then there's a cuff that goes over the forearm and they allow you to use the strength of your forearm um, to say dig. So the picture on the top left is of a person digging um, with a hand shovel that has that add-on cuff um, and they their hand is in a nice upright position. They don't have to have as much grip strength on the handle um, because that add-on cuff um, is using the strength of their forearm, helping them leverage that. And then this Easy Grip Garden Tool line, um, they also make long reach, um, long handled versions of their tools. Um, so this is great. Uh, they're these small hand tools, but they have this extra long reach on them, which is great for someone who needs to work from a, a seated or standing position. Um, another line of long handled garden tools is from the company Yard Butler. Um, so these tools are all designed to be used from a standing position and to use the gardener's body weight for leverage. Um, so I just have a couple examples on uh, the screen. The one on the left is of a long handle rocket beater, is what they call it. Um, so it's um, long handled, you can use it standing upright and there is a small um, little uh, extension that you put your foot on so you can push down with your foot um, and then it has tines on the bottom to go in there and get those pesky thistles out. Once you've pulled out the weed, um, there is a spring-loaded button on the top next to the handle so you can push down, expel, um, expel the weed. Uh, the picture on the right is of a gentleman using their long handle bulb planting tool. Um, so he's holding on to uh, the handles at the top, he's standing up and then using his foot to push down um, and it creates a, a hole that you can plop a bulb into. I moved on to the next slide, which is a few different types of uh, planting helpers. Um, the first one I have listed is, is the garden auger. Um, so they make auger attachments for your power drills. Um, you can often find these at many different stores. I know that we have one for our home that we got at Menards, um, but uh, you can find them at different home stores or online. Um, there is a company called Power Planter where that's what they do is they make, they specialize in these garden augers that um, attach to your power drill. And they go down and you can drill out different size holes um, depending on what you're planting. So a smaller hole um, for planting a bulb or you, they even have uh, larger diameter augers, um, say six inches for planting a six inch pot. Um, and that power planter company does make long, extra long augers. So you could do it from more of a standing position instead of need, needing to get down on the ground um, to do that planting. Courtney, I just wanna give you a five minute warning here. Okay, thank you, James. The next item, which is the picture I have on the screen is of the handy seed sower. Um, so if you look at my garden right now, you can see that I was distracted when I was planting beets um, that have tiny little seeds because they're all in one little place. Um, they kind of dumped out of my package and I was distracted um, all at once. So they're all in one spot. So if I had used a handy seed sower, I probably wouldn't have had that problem. So it's just this small little plastic device um, that what it does is you place your seeds inside of it. It's got a lid. And then as you're going, 
you turn the, the top of it to release a small amount of seeds at a time. So it could be great uh, for somebody that maybe has fine motor difficulties trying to get those tiny little seeds out. We call carrot seeds. If you've ever tried to plant those and know how quickly they can go everywhere. And then lastly um, is just an idea to use a long rigid tube to plant seeds from a standing position. Um, so maybe you used a hoe to create a line in your garden um, and you're gonna do row crops. Um, use a long PVC tube and you can stand upright and drop your seeds uh, slowly down it. And then you don't have to get down on the ground. Okay. Next section I have is about watering your garden. Of course, we have to maintain our garden. So on this slide, I have four different ways to make your garden hose easier to use. First idea is just to get a large handle grip that adds onto your existing um, hose tap or your faucet tap. So um, this is, what do they call it? The faucet grip, it's just extra large and it's great for someone who might have reduced grip strength. Um, and it creates a T grip and just goes on top of an existing a uh, round faucet uh, knob. Another idea is to swap out that knob style, um, if I say turner honor, because I can't think of the word, <laughs> um, with a lever style. Lever styles can often be easier to um, use for folks with a weak grip or fine motor difficulties. Um, so that's the bottom left picture is of a lever style, uh, controller for a hose. And then you can also attach a hose splitter, splitter um, to your spigot. And these are really nice. So if you say use a gardening wand um, to water some things and a hose with a sprinkler to water others, you don't have to be detaching um, your, your hose every time. You can leave that on. Related to that are these push-pull connectors or quick connect hose connectors. Um, they don't require you to use any uh, twisting motion to swap out your watering tool. So they just connect to your existing hose and spigot. For garden hoses, there's a few different ways you can um, make them easier to use. You can consider a coiled garden hose like the one pictured, a lightweight garden hose. The flexi hose is really well reviewed a hose caddy with nice wheels, or you can even consider doing a drip irrigation or soaker hose. Um, there is a great article that I found um, that's linked in the slides about which one might be better, but basically these allow you to lay out a hose and just turn it on and they'll water at the roots of your plants. So if you have plants that don't like their leaves wet, this is a really good option for them without having to get down on the ground. Um, there's two ways I have on the next slide about watering that can be a little less hands-on and very inexpensive. Um, the first is an oya. This is a traditional indigenous method of watering. Um, they are clay vessels, usually a clay pot, that you just bury in the ground um, and then you fill with water. And then they gently release, slowly release their water to the roots of the plants. Um, there are also DIY drip irrigation systems. Um, found a good link for how to make those using old um, soda bottles. Next slide I have, I'm, I know I'm gonna speed here. I have two ways to water difficult to reach plants. One is using a watering wand. These are um, come in different lengths, usually between a foot and a half and three feet long and they allow you to water from a standing position while still getting at the root of the plant, which is what the woman in the top picture is doing. Um, another consideration is to add a plant pulley, uh, just essentially creating a little pulley system for your hanging plants so you can lower them down when you need to water or do any tending. Okay, I know we're at the end of time. I'm just gonna go through, I think I have two slides, so. Um, found a great tutorial online about how to create a, um, 
a DIY adapted outdoor plant watering wand holder um, for someone that is in a wheelchair. Um, there's a link in the slides, but there's a young person in a power wheelchair and attached to their power wheelchair by a clamp on the tray is a watering wand holder. Um, they actually use um, uh, fishing rod holders to keep this in line and then they can go and water their garden. And I believe this, this individual is actually using a switch activated hose. Um, watering timers are very nice if you have, uh, if you're easily distracted or um, you might forget that you're watering. So you don't flood your neighbor's yard, which I have done a couple times. Um, so water timers just connect between your spigot and the hose. They allow you to program um, how frequently and for how long your sprinkler system runs. Um, I did find a comparison article with some different options. And then lastly, smart irrigation systems can be a great tool, but they are cost prohibitive. They require internet and they require that you have an <laughs> underground sprinkler system. Um, so if, if you have all those wonderful, um, these smart irrigation systems use real time information about the weather um, that they pull from the internet to water your plants appropriately. So they can be a really fantastic option. They just can be cost prohibitive for many. Amy just said that she left her hose running all night and she needs to set a timer. I feel that, Amy, I feel that. <laughs> um, so my last slide is just you know that we are here to help. Your State's Assistive Technology Act program is here to help. Um, if we didn't talk about your specific need, um, that doesn't mean there's not a solution out there. Um, you know, please contact us. We'd be happy to help you find the right solution. Also, um, your state's extension services um, offer great knowledge about plants, um, what types of planting, um, you know, how to do raised garden beds and vertical gardens, and um, just some really fantastic resources. Courtney, I just want to point out that Monica in the chat threw out that here in Minnesota, um, they access the Minnesota Horticulture Society's free garden in a box program, which provides all the materials to help seniors or other mobility income challenged individuals start a small garden, um, which is an amazing program. So I, I posted a link to that program in the chat as well, too. So thanks, Monica. Fabulous, Monica. Thank you for sharing. Um, what a great program. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today, folks. Yeah, um, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and get out there and garden.